these communities, there's a, a nice mix um, of people who maybe have been around the principals for a while, maybe people just checking things out, people that have a lot of experience in other areas. Um, so yeah, I'm just happy to talk about anything that comes up and I say, let's just see where it goes and nothing's off limits. That's, that sounds cool. That's right up my alley too. Um, so I actually, I, I think what I can do is I can get us started. And, uh, and Amy, I'm, I'm going to start off with sort of what I did email you about. Um, and so a couple of weeks ago, I think it was, I, uh, I ran across a post and I tried to find it and I can't, but the, the gist of it was, and maybe you can help me out here, Amy, if you recall, it was something around um, uh, the future of the principles or what we see for the principles. I can't remember specifically now, but your response struck me because it was a one word answer and it was reform. And I'm wondering if you could maybe, if we can sort of jump into the deep end a little bit with that and tell us what you mean about reform. Yeah, I think um, it wasn't about the principles at all. It was about mental health. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I, just, yeah. I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> the principles. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Yeah, Cause no, that, that's, thank you. Yeah, because that's, um, that's kind of my thing. Like, I, I just, and, and not, not that I'm like on a soapbox about it or, or, you know, uh, kind of serious about it. I think it's just so fascinating to see though where we are in history and for us to kind of get to play with that, to, to witness it and play with it. And so what I mean by that is like just, and I'm no, I'm no historian when it comes to this at all, but seeing how, you know, we seem to have gone at least, at least in psychology. And then of course, like coaching and other things kind of mirror that loosely. Um, but we've gone from, you know, like everything is, so meaningful and so serious and our psychology is this very big important thing that we we really if not need to would really benefit from diving into and analyzing and dissecting and it all means you know like freudian stuff of like oh you had that dream that means something about what your dad said to you when you were two and all of that yeah. you know i mean and how just the just to watch kind of the wave of that so we've gone from that to to things that are even just more behavioral like behaviorists like no everything's just conditioned but still we're we're kind of programmed with this stuff that seems very important in that right and then it has gone in more recent year and there's all kinds of um hugely like missing it a lot obviously but it's gone to more um feeling and recently really cognitive stuff right where it's like they kind of I think are seeing the role of thought in our experience, mm -hmm. but, but still in a way that kind of smacks of Freud where it's like, Oh, well that thought and this thought and, and how are we picking apart thoughts and content and let's look at it and change it and all of that. Um, so it's interesting and the kind of just in the more general self-help and, and self-help, I guess, or popular psychology side, there's been kind of a wave alongside that it seems where, um, where we were just this victims of what our parents did to us. And then we got really empowered, but then that empowered stuff kind of had a bit of a dark side where, oh, you have to identify your thoughts and write down your thoughts and change your thoughts. And, you know, and it was like, wait a minute, now I'm, bet now I'm a victim again. Now I'm a victim of my workbook where I have to write down all my thoughts. Oh, <laughs> and so, yeah. and then that gets people all up in their heads. So I just love seeing how that seems to have gone and where we are, at least in this and this call, you know, where a lot of, but I think even way bigger than this understanding, I mean, where a lot of people seem to be looking is, is kind of, you know, wow, maybe we aren't pulling all these strings and we can do things. We can play in life and we are not victims and we can rise above our psychology. And that is awesome and super fun, but it's also not on us to manage our experience, to change our experience, you know, like I think there's just such a, a sweet spot there. And so it's just, I don't know, to me, it's just so exciting and so fun. And, you know, the whole mental health side, like that's a whole other piece, but how we treat things like anxiety and depression, again, you know, it just is such a game changer compared to what's out there. So I think reform is happening. I don't mean to sound like, oh, we're going to reform it, but like, I just, it's happening and we can do our part if, if we want to. That's a, 
there's a lot in there in me. Wow. Um, the, the thing that jumped out at me is sweet spot. Can you, can you elaborate on, on, on how you see that sweet spot and, and maybe the principal's role in that sweet spot? Yeah, it's like, well, I don't know, but I'll try. Um, <laughs> it's the best we can do. Yeah. Um, I recently recorded a podcast episode called You're Gonna Suffer and Die. <laughs> it's a great catchy title, right? Everyone just couldn't wait to listen to that one. <laughs> but people did because they were interested, <laughs> which is the point. But the real point is, really, like, we're going to suffer in life. Yeah. Why, are we, why are we running from that? Why are we trying to coach it away? Why are we trying to mantra it away? Like, what, like, like let's, just, let's just say it's a given. To me, that has been, like, so, oh, so freeing say, you know what? I'm going to feel like crap a lot of the time. Mm. Who cares? Mm -hmm. Who cares? Because as soon as you don't care about it, as soon as it's off the table that it's going to be any other way, guess what happens? But that's not the point. <laughs> the point is like, you know, we're humans and we're here to have this range of experience. So we're all going to suffer at times. And uh, you know, you know what I mean by that, I hope. Like, I'm not saying let's camp out in suffering, but it's part of life. Sure. Feeling stuff we don't like is part of life. We're all going to die. No question. No <laughs> doubt about it. Relatively soon. And again, I don't want to be a downer, but you know, probably most of us on this call within, let's say 75 to 80 years, probably aren't going to be here. So we, we have like this little window, like what are we running from? It's yeah. going to happen. That like being able to be in that and then say, you know what, given that I'm going to feel bad stuff I don't like, Given that I'm going to die within 75 to 80 years, probably, what do I want to do? Mm -hmm. like, because who the heck cares? If we're going to die in 75 years, why are we so afraid of messing stuff up? Like, oh, why are we so afraid of feeling a bad feeling, feeling embarrassed, or feel, you know, like who cares when you see it's a given that you're going to suffer and it's a given that you're going to die? So, I don't know. <laughs> That's been my, like, to me, that is a sweet spot so, though, because it's like, we're not running from being human and from just taking life as it is. But when we don't run, it really does have this way of opening up kind of the next level, if you want to say it that way. And we are capable of so much that we're just not doing mostly because we don't want to fail or suffer. Wow. Again, so much. I, I got to share a quick, it's funny that you bring up that, you know, we're going to die. I, I had a, a funny, I was uh, relaxing out on the back deck and uh, it occurred to me suddenly that, holy shit, I'm going to die. And, and what am I doing? You know, why am I worrying? What am I, what am I wasting? Not wasting time, but what am I getting caught up in when the reality is I'm going to die? So in this moment of epiphany, I messaged both of my kids uh, text independently just saying, no, you're going to die, right? And... Uh, <laughs> Suffice to say, without context, that didn't go over so well. It made yeah. a pretty, pretty entertaining conversation later on in the day. But uh, no, that's brilliant. So what, um, I know you've already alluded to it a little bit, but what should we do? What should we be doing instead of worrying about the fact that we're going to die or, or getting <laughs> caught up in that worry? Like what, what's, yeah. your, what's, your, what's, your, what's your advice there? I mean, I don't know what you should do instead, but yeah. kind of knowing that as humans, like this, like we can all relate to what I'm saying in some way, if it hasn't totally turned you off, you can probably <laughs> relate to it because we all know that, that our mind goes there consciously and unconsciously. I mean, like even just, it's not like we sit around for most of us, hopefully thinking about the fact that we're going to die, but it's there and we're scared and we avoid things, especially the suffering piece. We, our whole life, like in so many ways is built around avoiding suffering. Yeah. which is so crazy because it's not possible. Yeah. So something about seeing that, like the suffering piece is maybe even, even better to look at. Like everything we do is because we want to feel good and we don't want to feel bad. Basically, I think at the root of everything we do, even the altruistic stuff, even the loving stuff, it's not selfish. It's like, of course we want to feel good. Feel, like, like that, that love and that connection and that feeling is who we are. We're all just looking to feel like home. 
So of course, you know, and that we can be kind and loving to others on the way. That's just bonus. That's great. So it's not a selfish thing, but Mm -hmm. you look at it, it's like everything we do is because we want to feel good and we don't want to not feel bad. But when that, when then we just set that over here, you know, like, Oh, I'm going to feel bad sometimes. Like I can't avoid that. This whole hamster wheel of life is to avoid something that's unavoidable. Then it's like, you know, you still notice yourself doing it because we still have a a psychology that runs and a mind that runs and all of that. And so it still wants to run us around, but but we, we just have a different relationship with it. You know, I think like I have just even seeing more about this recently, it's like, I still want to, my mind still wants to run me into like, oh, just do these little things today. This is what you do on Wednesdays and this is safe or whatever day this is, Thursday. This is safe. This is, keeps your business running. This is what you need to do for the family. Like, right. and then it's like, oh, that's a program. Like, not that I'm not going to do those things. You know what I mean? But it's like, yeah. oh, I don't have to just live here yeah. so that everything's okay and nothing hurts me. I can be here. And when I'm here, I'm not irresponsible still take care of my business and my family in a much better way. Yeah. So does that make sense? Like this, you notice this, but you're not like prisoned in this. Yeah. I, I love that. It, it, it sounds like, uh, like you're, you're aware that there's a certain container or structure within which human life exists, but we don't have to live inside in that container. We can, we can play within the knowledge of that, that existence. It's, it's a little, a little, a little inarticulate, but so all of that being said, Amy, which I think is a, is a beautiful way to start. How did the principles help us navigate that? Well, I think, uh, I'll just say for me, sure. you know, before the principles, I just took everything. I, 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 I didn't take everything. I thought, thought like as complete truth. I mean, I knew enough to know that thoughts are, are not as they appear, but I still, I still was really into kind of trying to manage them. I was afraid of certain feelings, you know, and, and still am, I think all humans probably are, you know, maybe not afraid in the same way, but obviously like we're saying, still want to feel what we still want to feel good. And that's, that's fine. But there was a whole, it almost feels like there was a whole, um, realm of life and experience and trying things and doing things that was kind of off limits, or maybe I didn't even see it, maybe kind of blind to it. And I think what the principles help us see because they're so simple and so essential is that all the stuff, like all the ooh, good feeling, bad feeling, like this, don't like this, all the labels, all the, all the judgment, all the opinion, are just the way that life's showing up through us in that moment. It really like kind of hits home. If we can really sit in that and say, wow, nothing I think is the truth, the truth, right? Like I think like thought moves through us. And even if it changes from here to here in a minute, well then like which one's the truth, right? Neither of them are the truth. It's just these fluctuations of, it's almost like light going through a prism, right? Like it's like different, different expressions of light. Which one's right, red or green? Neither are right. They're just red and green. And, and something about seeing how, how life moves through us and thought moves through us in that way and casts all these shadows and light and all this stuff and none of it's right or wrong or better or worse is like awesome. <laughs> and, then seeing, <laughs> you know, and then seeing that it's always changing. Yeah. So even if you get, even if you can't get over that something is not wrong, like it feels wrong, it feels hard, it feels whatever, well, it's going to change in a minute, right? Like there's just such a fluidity in that. Um, and I think it's just life changing, life changing for people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it certainly was for me. It was, a, you know, it, it wouldn't be too much to say that the principles saved my life is a little strong, but certainly opened me up to a whole new possibility of my time here on the planet. You know, powerful stuff. Yeah. Awesome. And we don't have to put anything in. That's kind of a good part. It's like, that's one, one of the things I love is seeing that our, our default, when we aren't caught up in all this, the default 
is like the you know beyond what we can even imagine in terms of possibility and creativity and love and like meaning and fulfillment and all the stuff that people are out trying to add we don't have to add anything that's huge i was really blessed to come across this while i had two really really small kids like my my youngest was just being born really at this time when i came across this and my daughter was two and I and it was so cool because I could just see it in them constantly. They weren't trying to add anything. Yeah. Whatever. Nothing they needed to add. Yeah. They wanted stuff just because they, you know, but like there was nothing they needed to add. And and they just showed so clearly what our default nature is, how we feel all this stuff and it moves and then we're fine. And that without learning anything, finding a purpose in life and achieving this or that we are so fulfilled i could see that you know so much in those little kids like wow they have they don't have a single achievement yet except maybe like eating solid food which is big deal it's not very exciting like you know they learn to walk oh but you know they don't have anything unique to them they had none of that stuff that i had been looking for my whole life and they were totally fulfilled yeah yeah, fulfilled and absolutely whole. That, yeah, I mean, the idea of nothing lacking, nothing needing to add, or not needing to add anything was a, certainly a game changer for me. And I, and I imagine it would be for most people. You know, for people that have been searching, I was in a, you know, part of the, the coaching certification that I just completed, we, we were talking about grounding. And people unanimously in the coaching conversations, people were, were talking about needing grounding. They needed to find their grounding. They needed to come to a place of grounding. And for me, it's, you know, we are grounded, period, except for the times that we believe that we're not. And uh, I found that really interesting to present that to a group of coaches who, who nodded and said yes, yeah. but didn't, hadn't come to the knowing piece of it yet. Yes. Yeah, not being additive. I, I just I segue for a quick, folks. I can see some of you. Are we heading in a good direction for everyone out there? Are we cool with what, what's going on here? I see anything you want to hear about questions, anything. Just yeah, I see. I see some nodding. So, I, so I, I guess we're doing okay. Dominic, you're good. You get, oh, Dominic's got a hand up. Oh, okay. Well, let's do it. Hold on there. Uh oh. Hey, Amy, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. Great to be with you on this. <laughs> Um, I had a question about a few thing, a few times I highlighted where it came up in your book, um, the, 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 and and then maybe something you said now about I don't know. There are almost two things, but we'll see. So something you said, like there's not good feeling and bad feeling, like that's part of it. Yeah. One thing, right. But then Sid also said, follow the feeling, listen for a feeling. So I just, that, just the distinction of that, because yeah. he also said that. And then I have another question after, but just if we can. Yeah. Well, I don't know exactly, obviously, what Sid said, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but like I, to me, that's like a, a, a resonance, an opening, you know, like, like, before we get to even good and bad, which is obviously very cognitive, conceptual, judgy, all that stuff, it feels like maybe, and see what you guys think, but like it feels like there's almost like an openness and a closeness in life. You know, like sometimes we just feel expansive and open and in the flow and all those words we put there. Sometimes we feel tight and closed and resisting or whatever. And of course, like I think our mind is probably going to say good, bad, right? That's just kind of how we were conditioned to have it feel. But what if it isn't? You know, it's like, like Dickens says, like, why is the inhale better than the exhale? No, there's just an inhale and an exhale. Is the open better than the close? And the, you know, no, not before a mind grabs it and decides that it likes one better than the other. So uh, my my take on Sid's follow a feeling is like, you know, sometimes something just pulls us into it. It just pulls us forward. And that's, that's beautiful. It's like a resonance, but it isn't the same as a, you know, good, bad, like it, don't like it kind of feeling. Got it. Yeah. I, uh, for, for me, the resonance dissonance and uh, it works 
usually yeah. instead of good and bad. But and and when I think resonance, resonance is that I, I am resonating. I am aligned with who I really am. Yeah. When it's dissonant, I am less aligned, less resonating with who I really am. So I kind of yeah. that for me is kind of where the guidance sits. But yeah. The, the other, maybe, I don't know if it's even related, but in your book, uh, there were several places and it popped up because I think while I was reading the book, there was also, you know, Amir's group and there's often lots of commotion that goes on in that group. <laughs> but, but there is a, like a lot of, you know, there's always, this keeps surfacing and dropping the debate about um, choice. Do you have a choice? Do we have free will? Like all that stuff. And then in your book, there are many places where you do speak to choice. You choose what to do with those thoughts based on what you understand about them. Like, I, I mean, I, there's a lot of quotes, lots of places, because it sort of highlighted for me where you did speak to choice. Yeah. Um, so, and, and, and maybe I'll say, I got the opportunity to ask David Banks that question. Yeah. He said, definitely Sid thought we had a choice right so he he said unmistakably sid knew that we have a choice and that we have free will no question about that right this what what david said about sid so i don't know what say you <laughs> yeah oh you know i hate it because and not it's a, it's a, i'm glad you asked it but um, i but i hate this question only because <laughs> I think we're all saying the same stuff. I, I just, I just think we're all saying the same thing with different language, and then it makes it sound like, oh, there's a choice camp and a no choice camp. And I honestly think we're one camp. We just use different words, and maybe we're looking at a different place along the spectrum to describe it. So, like when I, like I actually don't even, I wouldn't say choice in the way that I did three years ago when I wrote that book. It doesn't mean it's radically different, but it's more that when I wrote that book, I was. I was still looking more at the, at the form of the psychology of like a thought and a feeling once it's turned to form and it's something we experience. And at least sometimes, like what I was just literally feeling in my life when I wrote that is that, um, wow, now that I know that thought and feeling are just this thing that moves through me, it did feel like I had a choice. Whereas before I was just sneaking off to like steal food and eat it and you know in hidden places and do all kinds of crazy you know just caught up stuff once i started to see how things worked and my well-being raised it felt to me like i had a choice meaning my brain would still say "Ooh, you can do that no one's home go you know you had this is your opportunity it would say all that addicty stuff that a brain says but i could see my brain say that and be like nope not doing that so it felt like a choice, right? It does. And sometimes we have that experience, it seems. Now, <laughs> did like before when it didn't feel like a choice, that did, I wasn't choosing to, to make that choice. That did not feel like a choice. When I was just off feeling hijacked by urges and just, you know, doing whatever I felt like I had to do to feel okay, that did not feel like a choice. So it's, it seems like it's more of, a, I don't know that we ever really have a choice. Did I make a choice to be able to say no to the ice cream, you know, years later? I don't know if I even made that choice. It's like consciousness, well-being, all this kind of rearranges and new opportunities appear available to us at times. I don't know if that makes any sense. But it, so the whole thing, again, that's where it comes back. Like, I think we're all saying the same thing. It's just a wording difference thing is that. I don't know, like right now, I don't really even feel comfortable saying like, ooh, I made that choice because what, what even like put those options in my head? What even let, gave me the ability to feel like I made a choice? I, I'm not pulling those strings. It feels more like life's just moving through me. And if I'm up here, I, I feel like I have a choice. If I'm down here, I feel like I don't. And I'm not in charge of this, you know? But again, there's definitely an experience of, you know, I have a choice. Like right now, I feel like I have a choice in what I do and what I say and all that. But, uh, but I don't know how real that is. It feels more like a, like a perceptual thing. And, and what's important about that? 
one way or <laughs> one way or the other. Yeah. Well, no, it's a great. That's a great question. Um, and maybe that's part. Like I, you know. I don't think it, I don't know. I might change my mind about this later, but like, I don't know that it is important that we know whether we have a choice or not. That's kind of why it drives me nuts when people want to talk about this so much in circles, like who cares? I just think we just, we just live and think and feel and do what moves through us. And we have feedback built in. We have this amazing feedback system. So when we start to get tight or, you know, it's not going our way or we're resisting, that's showing us, oh, I'm really caught up in something. Maybe I can let go and, and kind of realign, get back to my nature. Yeah, it gets confusing, right? I'm really caught up in something. It's just happening to me. Yeah. But again, without agency. Yeah. So then let's just watch the movie and see where it goes. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do you enjoy the 75 years of life unless there's agency? Because well, then I could just watch the movie. I hope it turns out. We'll see how it turns out. It might be a horror. It might not be a horror. I don't know. Well, I don't, I don't think it works that way. I don't think anybody has 75 years of horror. I think we have 75 years of horror when we say, I, darn it, I want to write this script, and I want to be the main role, and I want this to happen. That's where we get 75 years of hell. I think, mm -hmm. I think when we are just watching the movie, all kinds of amazing stuff comes up that's way better than what our ego could have written into that plot. That, that's just how it seems to me. Again, and again, I get that mostly from watching kids. They're not writing a script. They don't really care how the movie goes in a lot of ways. And, and so it's like, there's a bit of wanting and steering and agency. And then there's like into something so much bigger than that. But, but to your point too, like I love agency. I think a lot, you know, I mean, it's so, so I think there's so many ways even of being in that, you know, where it's like the, it's, it's that irony where it's like the more we let go and we're not trying to be at cause of everything in our life, the more it almost feels like we have maybe some agency or the more we just enjoy everything that shows up. I don't know. It's a, that makes sense yeah. at all. Yeah. Late, well, let's go to others and then later I'll come back if there's another question. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, those great questions. Yeah, well done, Dominic. Thank you for getting us started. Um, well, I mean, we're pretty much halfway, so <laughs> we're started. <laughs> let's get rolling, man. Uh, we're not John, easing into this anymore. <laughs> Can you unmute yourself, John? Hold on, here, I got you. There you go. Go for it, John. Okay, hi. Hi. Um, so, in the background of what you've been saying, I've been hearing certain the idea of control we want to control things we want to control our life yeah um so when i was brought up one of the things i was trying to do was to control my emotions like you're not supposed to have this yeah like this is a good thing this is a bad thing and 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 then i started to notice that in some ways i became oppositional to like if i'm not supposed to have it i want it Mm -hmm. So it becomes a really strange circle. And I saw this strange thing once. I was, I was at a place where I did yoga. And one of the things they did was um, express your anger. So there was this young girl who was sitting there very quietly. And her mother was saying, I know you're upset. I think you should go and hit the, hit the, hit the dummy and express your anger. And she was saying, no, I am fine. I do not want to express my anger. I have no anger. So she was kind of like, in trying to in trying to control the relationship, yeah, and, and it seems that once we get into that kind of circle of trying to control our own th our thinking and then how other people think of us and how the dynamics of the relationship are going, that's when I, it seems to me that our thoughts really create the suffering that that you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, I think because our I think our mind. Um, I once heard it as like our, our, this is just our brain, right? Like our brain kind of has this like wild child and a dictator and they'll come out and <laughs> evil force, right? So like when the yeah. dictator comes up, like a lot of us have that dictator, like don't feel that, don't eat that, don't do that. Well, the wild child, that just wakes the wild child up and he or she's like, screw you, I'm doing what I want to do, right? So it's all just trying to find balance. 
So I think that's a big thing that happened. But it's cool to see, too, in, in terms of how we're talking here, that that's just a psychological thing. Mm -hmm. Now, just a psychological thing. It's pretty big, or psychology is a big thing. But, like, it's psychological. So we are having a conversation about it. Like, we can kind of see, oh, I see how that happens. I go over here, and then I go over here. And it's just my brain. It's just a machine in my head trying to find balance. And, and by us being able to be outside of it, then we're kind of not victim to it anymore. Yeah. It's, it's that. So what I've learned really is, is not to take my thoughts personally, mm -hmm. almost. It's yeah. like, so I guess they are mine. They're not yours. But it is that. You know, like, don't take it really personally because it, as you say, it will flow. And if I try and control it, yeah. I, get, I get more and deeper and deeper into my own stuff. Yes, totally. And everything, I think, like, hands off, it just restores itself. Again, that's the beauty in what we know from the principles is that there's innate health there. Like it's, everything's okay. Nothing's broken. So the less we're interfering in that way or in any way, the more things are going to just naturally thrive. Right. Yeah. I, one of the things that I enjoyed in your book was that, that, that idea of whatever we're doing is our, in that moment, it, we're trying to seek, we're trying to seek a good feeling. Yeah. And, and, and as most people you know, it, once people in recovery constantly say, like, we have to stop seeing the solution and start seeing it as the problem, the alcohol, the, the whatever it was. Yeah. It's just, a, I think Ann Wilson Schaefer used to say that our addictions are really uh, uh, um, inappropriate solutions for an authentic need. Yeah. So, yeah. Even as an inappropriate solution, it is cool to see the wisdom in that, that it's like we just don't feel good and we know that, you know, there's, there's, that's not us. And so, right, we find this inappropriate solution, which is just us doing the best we can see to do. Yeah. yeah. But then I think, as, as you say, you, with children, you start to do something, you go, oh, I don't like this. I'm going to stop doing it. Yeah. But potentially as an adult, it's like, well, I said I was going to do it. I'm committed to it, so I have to keep doing it. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I, I said I was going to take this job. I have to stay here or else people will think badly of me. Right. I'm the kind of person who all yes. that stuff, yes, all of our memories, all that stuff, it just, like, closes life in on us. And it's all made of thought. It's all the same, right? Right. We start to be, de define ourselves in a certain way and then believe it. Yeah. Yeah. I heard one of my colleagues, we did a workshop together a couple of weeks ago, and she had this great metaphor. Um, I loved it. She's talking about the show Hoarders. I can't use this in my work a lot because I work with a lot of hoarders, and I don't think they'd get the metaphor. But she, it, it was awesome the way she used it. So she's like, you know, like people who just have so much stuff. It's like you see on, on the show and stuff, you know, like they, they get to the point where they have this narrow little walkway through a lot of rooms in their house, or they have rooms they can't even get into because they have so much stuff in there. And that's kind of how we are as we collect thoughts and memories and opinions. <laughs> and those are us. It's like the walls just close in on us. You know, kids don't have that. They have all that stuff too, but it's just fluid coming and going. No big deal. But we, we grab it. We own it. Yeah. I think we, we confuse data and information with wisdom. Yeah. Can I interject here? John, does that, does that answer your question? And I, and I don't want to, I don't want to necessarily cut anyone off, but John, are, are no, you? No. Yeah. It was, it was really just to get a, a, an opinion. Yeah. I'm, I'm fine. And, and we can, we can, we can circle back, but it, it brought me to a question that's just, if Amy, I don't know how, you know, how familiar people on the call are with the principles, but I was wondering if you could make a bit of a distinction for us between mind and brain. Yeah. I mean, I, again, I don't know what's, this isn't like official or anything, but just the way I think of it is um, the brain is like literally a thing that you can put in formaldehyde in a jar. <laughs> it's a machine. It's an organ, you know? And, and I just, I get so much out of seeing that. Again, maybe not the organ piece so much, but the machine of it. Brain is just a machine. It works by certain rules. It, you know, it's very habitual by definition, by nature, because it needs to 
it needs to beat our hearts our whole life. It needs to do all kinds of stuff by habit. So it does. So it grabs onto things. It's very, very smart in terms of its machinery and how it works, but it's not wise. So it'll grab onto anything that just gave you some happy chemicals, you know, and say, yep, she needs this. He needs more of that. It's not wise enough to see, oh, no, that's actually poison. <laughs> it just says, ooh, happy chemicals, you know, yep, more of that, more of that. And so it's just a, just a smart machine. And then mind is, I mean, then we could say, like, you know, little mind is, like, kind of how we see things, right? How our, our life, our little separate reality is being created within us. And big mind, I don't even know. That's everything. But very different from brain. Cool. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It just seems like a good place to, to, to add or to throw that distinction in. Um, yeah. We heading in a good spot, people? We still doing all right here? Roger, go for it, young man. You're up. Oh, hold on. Are you trying to unmute you while I'm trying to unmute yourself? Or vice versa? <laughs> I think it's that. <laughs> yeah. Hold on. Okay. No, no, I'm not. Okay. I will see <laughs> pressing buttons then. Roger, the, the floor is yours. Oh, I didn't want the floor. You, oh. you asked if it were all right. Oh, um, yes, <laughs> I thought you right. were end up with a question. Can, can we put you on the spot? You got anything for Amy? Not really. Thank you for the book. I'm, I'm halfway in it only. But uh, I... The last thing that was on mine we can take just for something. Yeah. A different unbelievable helpful view is that habits aren't about your character or your circumstances. Habits are thoughts that feel compelling and often unco uh, uncomfortable, but they are actually quite impersonal. I just uh, felt it was a uh, Good, uh, what you say, distinction. The impersonal piece around habits, I think, is not talked about much and is so huge. Yeah. Because, of course, you know, of course, we think we are our experience and it's all about us. I mean, it's just how every human's wired, right? We are the center of the universe and everything we do and think and feel is about us. And it means something about us, even when we know it doesn't, that's the feeling of it. So I think, you know, just to kind of see, wow, just like I was saying, it's a machine like I told myself I wasn't good enough and as we do, didn't measure up in all kinds of ways. And then my mind came up with this idea that if I looked a certain way or ate a certain way, I'd be okay. Now I didn't make that, that's pretty dumb, but it felt real to me at the time. So then I didn't eat for a long time. And then my brain trying to keep me alive said, this isn't cool, you better eat a lot right now. And that, so it's like, to just, just to see the machinery of that, the wisdom in that machine. Now, all the while, I thought I was just a big loser. I was weak, I had issues, I thought it was about food, I thought I had this addictive personality. It was never about me, ever. It was just this, it was just this conversation playing out in my head that felt, that talked all about me, because everybody's does, and, and then it just became like me, and that's important, because when we start to see it isn't personal, and it isn't about us, it just loosens up, infinitely so, because when it is about us, and it is personal, oh my gosh, I mean, it's like a web, it's just like this sticky spider web, where everything gets stuck in there, you know, it's all, it's so much shame, and then our past, and what it must mean about us. And I mean, I told so many stories like, oh, this must mean that I don't care about my relationship because my relationship suffers because of my addiction. Like, no, it never meant any of that ever. So I think that piece, I'm glad you said that. I'm glad we randomly called on you and made you say something. Because I just, I think that piece is huge though. Really. Like, yeah. It's not personal. And you can, you can feel, even if you don't have a habit or addiction right now, like you can feel how that would lighten things up and loosen things up for people. An image. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Roger. Yeah, it just fits with the last thing I wrote here. The brain is smart, but not wise. That was a good one, too, from you. 
I'm thanks, Roger. I didn't Thank mean, you. Didn't mean to put you on the spot there, man. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Um, an image that's coming to mind for me is fascial tissue in the body, and how when your when your fascial tissue is constrained, everything feels like it's smaller and getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And then you stretch a little bit and you loosen joints off, and everything feels feels more expansive and open. So that, yeah. that's the image just that, that just there, that, that just popped in for me, Amy. Um, what else we got, folks? We got we got about fifteen minutes, you know. Let's 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 use our time wisely. Otherwise, I'll have to ask another question. Oh, okay, Dominic, you you second, Kathy, you're up to bat. Oh, how'd that happen? Hold on, Kathy. Hmm? How's that? Yes. Yeah. Kathy, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Kathy. Hi, Amy. Hi, Kathy. Kathy Elliott. Um. Oh. Kathy, you, Kathy, you're muted again. There we go. There we are. All right. Yeah. Reboot. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Because your your sound went way down. That's why I'm asking. Oh, now we got you. Can you still hear us or hear me? Very low. Hmm. Oh, that's weird. There, I got you. I, 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 I speak it. Thank you. Pardon me, guys. Okay, so I always withhold this question because I don't know how to word it, but I have this feeling from the the, the part of the I, I didn't get to finish your book, Amy, but I got the gist of it and it's it's wonderful. And I think you're somebody that can help answer this. I'm gonna give you a specific example. Um, you know, we all talk so easily right now uh, sort of theoretically about brain and mind and feelings and you know how to act or think or get through a certain situation but i want to give you a situation that i went through um my partner died and um you know there was a lot leading up to the death and cancer and etc and then after that uh the death i came to find out there had been for nearly 28 years a life a secret life i didn't know about and it was a very painful situation. Now I had many years of participation in my belt by that time, and a, a lot of just a lifetime really of mental health training and tools and all kinds of things. And I'm not particularly a complainer, but I want to tell you that was painful, and the pain didn't go away. And during that immediate period of time, one or two years after that came to light. I'll tell you one of the most painful things was that everybody who was involved with the principles would just say, oh, that's just thought. And I'm telling you, I got to the point of when that person said, oh, that's just thought when I'm double over with pain. So I just, I'm going to leave just the story right there about, yes, I hear what you're saying about the brain and I know all those kinds of things, but there there is something called grief and separation and there are we do just go through uh tremendous feelings when we go through traumas I mean, yeah. it could be a car accident it could be death whatever yeah i don't know how I'll, i'm going to stop right there and see if you can kind of pick up on what i'm saying about it's not quite that simplistic to I'll tell you how I got through the first months. I would just say to myself, Kathy, those, those thoughts are gonna change. Or you just hold, hold on, go to the yoga class, hang in there, you're gonna feel better. Because I knew to do that, but that, that, was, that was about all I could think straight about. Yeah. So try it. So do you think, do you think it should have been different? Yeah, yes, I do, because, and I'll tell you why. One of the things I enjoy about your book and different these sort of second generation people of the principles books is that they turn to other uh, uh, belief systems. And um, it's not just, it, it just I, I understand about Sid, believe me, but that's not a cure-all because we need nurturing and comforting and we're human beings and things like that. And that element 
of just human nurturing and caring and hugging and saying, oh my God, that's really sad, or I'm sorry to hear that, or I'm sorry for your loss. That kind of element it isn't, was never present. I, I was sort of very overly loyal, I think, to the principles and SIDS and all those kinds of things. And so I didn't maybe around, have around me people who understood about just plain old fashioned comforting. Now, did, does anything I does that make sense to you? What I'm trying yeah. to say? Yeah. Component is missing, and it's a shame. I'm just curious. I guess in your grieving, in all the you know, you're grieving after you found all this out. If um, if you think you should have been, like been over it sooner, or like if it should have gone differently, like I can see in hearing your story how. Hearing a bunch of people that maybe you've known for a long time and respect say it's just thought would just piss you off <laughs> and would make it would make your grieving. I mean, again, slower and harder and only because not because life is doing something different, but like, you know, the fascist tight, like your mind and everything goes up. Somebody says to you, oh, it's just thought. And what you really need is a hug, you know, then of course, like everything in you restricts and then the natural grieving that was happening through you, it's like its like the hoarders, like it all got tighter around you, right? I think when someone hugs us or says, oh my God, I can't believe you're going through this, or just sits and lets you cry and complain and kick and scream for, for hours, it opens stuff up, you know? It's, it's made of thought either way, but who cares? Like that's not the point in those moments, right? We still need to let it move. So, Yes. Okay. That, that's that. That's very true, and that's kind of how I function. I am naturally very loving and very affectionate, and very easily read people and see when they want uh, some kind of warmth in my yeah. whatever. And I didn't find that in. I'll tell you, the only place I ever found it was in an SLAA meeting, which is a twelve-step Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous meeting. That was the only place I ever just found that kind of warmth of yeah. voices of honesty of having been in a certain situation and um i forgot what you said just now but or what i wanted to say but we'll just drop it at that i think i think you understand because i i even went i even went and tried like straight regular regular old therapists i thought i just was like desperate to get out of pain and um That didn't work either. I um, so I'll just I'll just drop it right there. Thank you for your answer. I like the idea that we can now turn to other whatever you call them modalities or uh, healing systems. Or I mean, I've ended up getting Reiki help and yeah. I, you know, for what it's worth, and this might be sacrilege to say, but um, I sometimes feel really, really grateful. Oh. Sorry. Can... Yeah, I'm not sure. Kathy, Kathy's unmuted still. Um, everything okay. from here looks like it's fine. Uh, Can you uh, hear now, Kathy? Okay. I was just going to say, um, I sometimes feel really grateful that that I am a second generation. Not that I wouldn't have loved to have yeah. been able to sit in Sid's living room or on the fire, but... You know, I think, I think there is, a, I think there is such a loyalty to the person that they loved and, and everything that was said there that in a sense, maybe sometimes, and I'm sure it's happened for all of us, you know, that we, we have a loyalty and then we kind of close down to other things. So I agree with you. I think it's beautiful that there's a generation of people coming up that have been really, really deeply touched by his work by not knowing him at all and still kind of like see other things, you know, and, um, but Thank you. Oh, you're muted now. Sorry, or you're not muted, but yeah, something's, something's going on. Kathy, again, we've lost you again. Yeah, everything from here looks fine. Amy, do you see her as unmuted as well? Yeah. yeah oh, no, I'm fine. You can't hear me. You know, now we can. Okay. <laughs> All right. Coming in now. No, thank you for saying that. And it took a long time to get to this point for there to be a second generation that developed. I'll, and um, I'll never forget, I stumbled onto Ankish's Facebook group and I thought, 
God, this is beautiful. Look at all the other authors he's bringing in and speakers and things, and yet he still believes in the, in the principles. Wow, how come I didn't think of that? And I started immediately feeling better from that point onward, that I was, it was okay to be unfaithful to sit in the yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Kathy. Are you good with that? All thank right. You, awesome. Kathy. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a uh, that was a pretty brave share. We appreciate it, Kathy. Thank you, um, Dominic. I saw you had your hand up. Holy crap! We have. Sorry. What I meant is, oh my goodness, we only have five minutes left. Um, Right on. You might want to do, do a different close or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, go for it, Dominic. Oh, well, my thing, I guess the, what it was was an observation, and I don't know how accurate this is because I don't – my coaching, I'm mostly coaching people in kind of the co corporate world, leaders like that. But this, I noticed this thing about people who have either – been in strong addictions or in prison or thing like that. So for some reason, it's something I noticed on Facebook. I saw some, not in three principles, just in the world, right? Who sort of transformed and came out of that. And they, they really speak to this idea of discipline and willpower and and this idea of choice and how you turn your life around and you control your thoughts and all of that yeah. and i've seen a few of that a few of those and really miraculous transformations like people who become responsible and and gone into life in a good way and i kind of like maybe this speaks to coaching and meeting people where they're at I just imagine myself, if I needed to work with a person like that, how I would be really gentle <laughs> in, in, in having a conversation with them to tell them, it's really not you. You're not the one in control. This yeah. is a bigger thing. <laughs> like, I think it's actually pretty healthy for them that they think that it is self-discipline and willpower that has accomplished whatever they've accomplished. And, and maybe at a different level that they'd be at could be a more useful conversation to go beyond that. To yeah. Start about it. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I think um, it kind of is back to the willpower and choice question too. It's like at a certain level, it's so empowering to think I have choice. I did this myself. But then, like you said, it has that level has limits at some point. Mm -hmm. So it's like you see people there and then, and then they hit, they kind of bump their head on the ceiling, right? Or they have a setback, and then now everything's out the window because they're the big loser that didn't have enough willpower to prevent their setback. So then it's like, oh, that sometimes propels them to that next level of, oh, maybe I'm not spinning the planets myself, and there's like something bigger happening. Right. Yeah. Good, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, Amy, we got just a few minutes left, and uh, if no one else has a question, I've, I've got one that I'd like to throw out, and it's, and it's really about how, um, you know, as I've gotten a little bit of experience with the principles and I'm now exploring, uh, you know, a formal coaching modality, I'm curious about how you transitioned, you know, what your practice looked like coming out of a formal education and how you either blended the principles in or gave up the education piece. Or, like, how, how, does that, how does that all fit together now for you? Or how did it come to fit together? Yeah. Yeah. Um. It was pretty seamless. I mean, I, oh, I say that now, and it, maybe that's just my memory fading because it's been several years. But um, the whole, the whole like traditional psychology piece was pretty easy to kind of cast away. Right. Um, but when I first was first coaching, I coached, you know, like kind of using Byron Katie work and was very heavily into law of attraction and different things. But with a lot of strategy, a lot of stuff in there, um, I still see the complete wisdom in all of that but the, the how to do it, the implementing it piece looked a little different. Right. Um, so when I first came across the principles, again, those, it's all speaking to the same truth to me. But I think just in a practical sense, when I would actually sit down with a client, it just started to feel better to me and look like it was more helpful for them when we just had more of like an exploratory conversation about this, right. you know? So that's it. So I, I think for a while it was like a little less, 
do this, try this, visualize that, a little more conversation. And then within a matter of months, probably, it just became more however it, whatever it is that I do now. Um, but just because, again, just very organically, because that was like, oh, this helps. That's very cool. So it was just, it was basically the observation of what worked. Yeah. Yeah. And me just wanting to do what was easier and felt better. And that, again, that was just very organic though. I'm like, wow, this is nice. We can just explore these things and ask some pointed questions and I can kind of see how, what, what they think of how life works. And we talk around that and things opened up better than when I was having them question their thoughts and do a lot of the, those more strategy things. So, so it, it sounds to me like um, the fundamental shift is one away from problem solving. That's yeah, it. away away from prob- from what they think is the problem anyway, and more towards seeing that you know what what our problems are all made of. At the end of the day, is that resistance when we open up? It doesn't mean life changes and our bills get paid and our husband stops being a jerk or any of that. But it's like when we open up. We just see new, we see our own solutions and we're open to other solutions and we just, everything kind of goes up. Super cool. Wow. We are right on the hour. Um, so if someone's hand doesn't go up in the next 30 seconds or so, <laughs> I'm going to very slowly start asking Amy if there's any thought she has to add. Actually, Amy, you said uh, in your email that you, you're, uh, you've you got a new coaching program coming out in January. Do I have that right? Yes. Can, can yeah, you- so I, I've been mentoring um, people who have been, who have, are coaches, a lot of like therapists or people who are just kind of new to the principles understanding and wanting to kind of incorporate this into the work they do. I've been doing that for a while um, in a very small group format kind of way. But, um, but I also get a lot of people who just read this book that most of you didn't read. <laughs> I'm kidding. That some of you read maybe. Um, <laughs> the most of you are reading is the same way. Thanks, <laughs> Um, that read that book because they had a habit and they find freedom and they're not coaches and they're brand new to all this. And so I am just starting a kind of level one, you know, training certification on how to start to work with some, someone who has anxiety or a habit that they want to be free of from, from more of this understanding. Super cool. And that's, and that's in January is, uh, is that public not like, is that out? Uh, like next week, like literally the page is being created now. So very shortly, that'll be more public. Um, but the way I work with people myself is through my the little school of big change. Mm-hmm. So that's a, a little online school I have. It's not that little anymore. Um, mm-hmm. And that runs twice a year. So that's starting up in September. And again, that's just how I get to coach people to help them through habits and things. Super cool. All right, ladies and gentlemen, any, uh, it's now, well, it's perhaps not now or never, but at least for now, it's now or never. So, all right, unmute all. Thank Let's you, guys, so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you for being here. Yeah, uh, I will, uh, I'll, I'll post the video, you know, uh, today or tomorrow. It'll be up on uh, in the book club, book club page. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And uh, you're all awesome. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Thanks Amy. Everyone. Thank you. Michael, our walls are so colorful. Oh, oh, <laughs> I was just scared at that the whole time. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's exactly oh, color is my wall. <laughs> I'll show you the rest of mine, but it's pretty messy still. Anyway, all right, everyone, have a wonderful day. Amy, thanks, thanks again so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. thanks for having me. Have a wonderful rest of the Thanks, day. Amy. Yeah, love you Bye-bye. all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.